and gentlemen, grab your pen and paper and write down three things you're grateful for. This is OD on Life. Come get high with us. Hey everybody, it's Dan O'Donnell here. It's OD on Life, episode number 11. And today we are here with Connor Doran. Thank you for coming on, Connor. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Dan. Thank you. Uh, The goal, as you probably know by now, of each episode is to provide every listener with at least one gem that they can take away and actually apply to their life. So we'll be trying to do the best uh, we can to do that for you here today. And, um, you know, hopefully it's also entertaining, inspiring, but that is the real goal is that it's empowering for you. Uh, You can check us out on iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. We're in all of those places. And feel free to give us uh, a review on iTunes, you know, likes and comments on YouTube. We appreciate all of that. So... Um, Connor, let's see. We could start in a bunch of different places. First of all, I want to mention that you're from the county that my extended family several generations ago is from in Ireland, which is Donegal. Yes, indeed. Which is kind of cool. And uh, it's pretty cool. The O'Donnells actually have a castle there. I think you said, did you visit it? I've been there, yes. That's I have awesome. Indeed. I haven't, which I'm ashamed They're to admit. They're taking really good care of it yeah, for you. I've seen pictures. I want to go check it out and uh, reclaim my throne, like you said. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So um, you've been. So you're from Ireland. Yes. You've lived in Korea. You're currently yes. living in uh, not Ireland. We're in Thailand right now. That's aren't we? exactly where we are. <laughs> so um, I wanted to get into that a little bit. What brought you to Korea? And was there somewhere before Korea? Or is that where you went after you left Ireland? Um. Uh, but after Ireland, I, I went to Sweden. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked in a uh, ceramic studio. I was originally a ceramic artist and wanted to travel more of the world and I thought, how can I do that? (laughs) And uh, teaching English seemed to be a better option, it was more feasible and uh, there I went, off I went and I got stuck in Korea (laughs) quite nicely and spent about 12 years there. How did that happen? Were you looking, you know, did you call somebody and say, where do I get a job teaching English? Or did you, how did you find that? Or did you just go and figure it out? Yeah, it's like most things just pops into your path. Depends what you're going to do with it. And I'm like, yeah, that, that looks good. Yeah. My girlfriend pointed it out in a local newspaper. Yeah. Cool. You know, this <clears throat> might be already the gem for like half of our audience. If you are somewhere and you don't, you know, you want to explore, see the world just like Connor was in that same position. If you have, if your native language is English, that is a trip to almost anywhere, especially in Asia. Yes. But lots of other places, I'm sure. Um, I have several friends who taught English in China. You taught in Korea. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people here in Thailand who are teaching. And uh, some of them, that's exactly what they want to do. Some of them use it as a way to get there, to get the visa, and then figure out what's next. Yeah, it's yeah, that can be a whole discussion in itself. Yeah. Uh, you can teach anywhere in the world. I've hundreds of friends that are teaching all over the world. Yeah. Most of them came to Korea and then ventured you know, Taiwan, China. Um, I've got a friend who's uh, taught in Korea for a while. Now she's a principal of a school in Mongolia. Wow. Uh, Nguyen Batar. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, lots, there's lots of possibilities, and uh, it can be quite fun. Yeah. that's a It's a huge thing on a lot of people's resume that they don't even realize how important it is, I think. A lot of people going, man, if I could just work for two more years and put away enough money to take a trip for two months and travel Southeast Asia or something, which a lot of people do exactly that. They do, yeah. Or you can just quit your job next week and start teaching English next month in whatever country you wanted to check out. That's one way to go. So I'm glad you brought that up. That's cool. I didn't realize that's exactly what you were doing in Korea. Well, let's see. I, I did. I, I was teaching in a university, which was the reason I stayed there for so long. Was I was teaching six hours a week, three days a week, and getting five months paid vacation a year, which enabled me to wow. travel the world. Yeah, and <laughs> which was pretty cool. Yeah. And you know, when your base, if your home base is Korea and you're from Ireland, you're within spitting distance of all these places that you'd probably never been. Exactly. That's what, I didn't really realize that until I got here. I've been in Chiang Mai for a little over a year. And for example, AirAsia flies all over this 
part of the world. And, you know, in a few hours I can be in Nepal or India or all these places that from the U.S. are this huge trip. You know, if you're if you just have three weeks and you're going to India and coming back, it's hard to fit it in. You know, but here in, in Chiang Mai, you know, in a three hour flight, maybe I can be in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I can go down. Um, you know, I went to Hong Kong in two and a half hours from here. So if you can change the part of your, the world that your home base is in, it's a pretty liberating thing. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's quite nice. Uh, I traveled extensively throughout Asia for over the past 12 years. Yeah. And had some wonderful journeys. Snook into Tibet. Really? In, in through, uh, in through Zongbian, which is a quite, a, quite an interesting journey. And that is a Chinese place? Zong, Zongbian is, uh, some people call it the Shangri-La. It's one of the oh. spots that they think was Shangri-La. Uh, north of Kunming in China. And uh, so I went into Tibet without a, without a permit. Uh-huh. Had to get a Chinese guy, a guy I met in a bar called Jango Bing. Hopped on the back of his motorbike. He took me down to the bus station. He bought the ticket, gave it to me and told me, tomorrow you get on that bus, the bus driver's going to try and stop you. You push past him. And I, got, I pushed past the bus driver the next day with my ticket that he bought and spent four days on a bus traveling into Tibet in the most hilarious interesting exhilarating bus journey I've ever been on in my life it was just unbelievable and that's another story I suppose it sounds like it. that sounds like a movie maybe pushing right past the, so the guy I mean what's the deal he's just got enough other stuff to deal with that if you just ignore him he'll, exactly. he'll give up yeah exactly wow yeah. that's interesting <laughs> he just gave up he's like, yeah. okay. it's funny um, China to me I've only been there once I was there probably three weeks ago now and I was there for a week um, I flew into Hong Kong and went over to Shenzhen to um, meet with companies about manufacturing Better Me, and which is a board game if you haven't heard of it. Anyway, uh, it's just so different from anywhere I've been. There were all these little things. This is what I love about traveling is you can read The Lonely Planet or watch YouTube videos or whatever, but there are all these tiny little details that you would never think of if you didn't go there. <clears throat> and one of them just you brought it up to my mind when you're talking about lines and pushing and blah 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 you know Chinese are kind of famous for like cramming into subway doors and getting in these crazy lines or ignoring lines And uh, but what I noticed was I was buying metro tickets for the subway and as I'm pushing buttons on the screen and standing there almost every time whoever was in line behind me for some reason would be like craning their neck to look over my shoulder and see what I was doing which I still don't really understand that I mean, are they just trying to figure out how the screen works so that they know what they're doing when they get there? Or are they really curious where I'm going? Or what? Is it just like something they don't even realize they're doing? Do you know about that? I think it's just curiosity. Is it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Every time it happened, it was I was wondering what was going on, but I never actually really figured that out. But it's just one of those specific little travel things that I never would have... I don't think anybody in their blog writes about that, you know? Nice. Um, anyway, that's kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, there were uh, many things like that in China that were just so different from anywhere I've been. Um, yeah, they, they say it's the best education traveling. Yeah, and it definitely is. Yeah, one example is uh, you know I had it in my head that any Chinese city over say a million people is really dirty, really noisy. You can hardly breathe the air. There's going to be dust every time a car goes by. Dust is going to blow in your face and all of that, which I think may be true in some places. But I went to Shenzhen, and there were trees everywhere, and it was loud. People honk horns a lot in China, or at least in Shenzhen. But I was so surprised. There was a giant park right next to my hotel, um, much more green than I expected. The air, I had just left Chiang Mai, where it was really smoky at the time. Yes. The air was cleaner um, than I thought. It was a coastal city, more or less. So anyway, I was pleasantly surprised with Shenzhen. That's my two cents, so go check out China. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so that sounds like quite a bus ride. Uh, yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I remember at one point we. Uh, it was the rainy season, and treacherous roads going over the hills. You look down the sides, and it's like a two hundred meter drop. And we had to get out on a few occasions to to dig, <laughs> so that the bus could get through the actual road. So there's twenty of us out just digging. Digging like snow or mud or what's going on? Rocks, stones, oh, rocks. Yeah. and uh, it got to the point where the third time it happened, where the the bus lights are lighting up the the side of the hill as we're 
digging and because of the altitude to your heart is mm. pumping really hard and we had to give up and I remember <laughs> nobody had a flashlight but myself and I gave it to the bus driver and we hiked to the nearest village and we're talking right next to us it's just this 200 meter drop so we've got to be careful about that and off we go and at one point we we ended up uh, in the back of a truck with a tarp over it straw and a goat nice. and uh, I just remember holding on to the bars with the, I got my flashlight back and that's in my mouth and I'm the only light that we have in the whole journey um, to get to the village it's just uh, just an amazing journey and that's what happens when you, when you get out there and do a bit of travelling yeah experience some wonderful things and some things that might irk you and uh, they'll make you they'll make you a better person if you if you let them yeah if you let the experience you push past that metaphorical bus driver and get out there huh? yeah exactly it reminds me of Randy Pausch <clears throat> who did the last lecture I don't know if you've ever seen that if you're listening and you haven't seen the last lecture by Randy Pausch go check it out Pausch is P-A-U-S-C-H uh, anyway he talked about um Obstacles are there not to keep you out. It's to keep out the other people who don't want it bad enough. You know, it just creates more space for you once you push past the bus driver, whatever your bus driver is. So um, I know this is far less extreme example of what you're talking about. But when I travel to new cities, one thing I like to do quite often is I'll take the metro line, whatever it is, a bus, a train, um, because obviously that's usually the easiest way to get around. I'll take that to the end of the line and then I'll just keep walking that direction. And after 10 minutes, I'm the only non-native person around, you know. It t- and then all of a sudden, it's, there's no, no tourist um, travel agents, none of that. It's just the locals hanging out, you know. Yeah, beautiful. It's, yeah, it's, I've wound up in some really cool little neighborhoods, you know. I was outside of Barcelona, and there was some neighborhood party thing going on, and they're playing, you know, bocce ball or something like it. And, you know, the kids are running around, and it's just all people that live there. And some giant community party, and... I remember eating a hot dog in a parking lot at a hardware store, you know, outside of Prague. And if you're in the middle of Prague, you know, tourists might even outnumber the locals. But when you're out a mile and a half past the end of the bus line, you're the only guy that's not from there, you know? It's yeah. Pretty, it's pretty cool. It's a much better experience. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm curious now. You've been to Tibet, which not a lot of people can say that. You said you went all over Asia. Where else have you been? I mean, what, what were some of the highlights, I guess? Oh, um, God. The highlights, I suppose, you know, what, what doesn't kill you is going to make you stronger. I spent, uh, I spent my birthday on at Everest Base Camp, and I got absolutely hammered drunk at that altitude. Ooh. I was smoking back then, too. And a, <laughs> a hangover for hell. I spent three days up there and, uh, and I don't know what was going on in my mind but I just thought I was hard as balls and I'd just keep drinking and smoking um, to a point where it was like well I can't do this anymore and uh, I had to come down but yeah got my passport stamped at the post office up there and uh, cool uh, sent off a little postcard to my grandfather yeah it was nice good time but yeah do not drink and smoke when you're High altitudes. Yeah. It's not good. How? I mean, it's called base camp, but how high is the base camp of Everest? It's. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm sure you can Google yeah, that. Yeah, we'll have to look that up later. later. But yeah, it's up there. Oh, it was just yeah, yeah. I don't recommend drinking alcohol. Yeah. Who Who did you meet at the base camp there? I mean, you, you're probably meeting with all these people. But was it season actually, for expeditions? I, I met uh, I met a few Koreans that had a lot of Korean soju, and so we had to partake in that because yeah. it was my birthday and. Because they had the soju, right. yeah. <laughs> which is the equivalent of, I don't know, vodka, I suppose. Yeah. And what's it like there? Is it mostly people checking out base camp, or is it like the majority of the people there are getting ready to actually climb Everest or are part of the expedition? Yeah, it's it's a lot of people just coming to you know say they've been there, yeah. and sort of a check it off on your bucket list, I suppose. But yeah. it's a yeah, you get up there and there's a few little shacks, and um, they're got little boilers inside them. So it was like little yurts that you'd find in Mongolia. Yeah. And uh, it's quite cold, and depending on the time of year. And yeah, they're, they're just up there, and you can stay the night. And it's, yeah, it's a novel idea, and it's quite nice. That's cool. And then, yeah, you've got some people that are obviously prepping to climb Everest, and they go further. 
Yeah, interesting. And so, fast forward, how did you wind up over here in Thailand? Did you visit and like it or something else? I came here first in 2002. And, uh, yeah, I, I liked it, but I didn't think. I just I ended up here through a series of synchronicities. And it was a friend of mine that was also studying in the same nutritional course as me. And uh, Guy Hopkins. And we ended up being peer coaches. And through that... And through another friend that was dating a girl from Chiang Mai that was coming over here. And things just seemed to be leading that way. I was like, yeah, I think this cool. is uh, a place to go check out, which I decided, yeah. Yeah. Just decided to jump in. Right. You mentioned peer coaching. Is, so your friend Guy is also a coach? Yes. So you coach each other? Maybe. At the time, yeah, when we were you know, studying. And it's nicely, I think everybody should have a coach yeah. on a regular basis. And uh, just someone that's going to be accountable and can be check in and see that you're getting to where you want to get to. Yeah. It's like, right, I want to get to a certain place. I want to achieve this goal. And How can I get there? Sort of looking at where you are, looking at where you want to get to, and then looking at the blockages or what's in the way. Right. That's an interesting concept. I've never heard of peer coaching like that. Hmm. You got me thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Because lately, actually... I, mean, I don't even know if I can say lately. That's something I just read a book uh, by Gary Keller called The One Thing. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it was good. Um, I had a couple takeaways from it, you know, and one of them was he said more than once in there that people that get extraordinary results, it's hard to find somebody getting extraordinary results who doesn't have a coach, mentor, somebody holding them accountable. Definitely. And, uh, and that jumped out at me as right now this second, I don't really have that in an official way. I have peers that I talk to and we kind of inspire each other and keep track of what's going on. But um, I actually, I run mastermind groups for other people, but nice. right now I don't have that kind of relationship. So I cool. made a note, you know, to get on that. And so that peer nice. coaching is an interesting concept. Well, I'm setting up a mastermind group at the moment, so maybe we'll talk more about that. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Nice. I need. I feel like uh, if I'm going to tell everybody how great mastermind groups are, and you should join the one I'm facilitating, yeah. I need to, you know, you do, yeah. get on it right myself. And I've been in them many times. And if you're listening, you have never been in a mastermind group. And this isn't just me trying to get you to sign up for mine. They are so powerful. And I've been in two person mastermind groups, which is almost what you're describing. And then I've been in up to about six members. That's kind of the range. Usually, I'd say three to three to five is ideal, in, in for my preferences. But um, man, to just have somebody that you know, when you make a commitment this week, you're going to be sitting down with these people or jumping on Skype or Google Hangouts or whatever next week, and it's written down what you said you would do, and they're going to be checking in on you. How'd it go? You know, and of course they're there to help and support you. But for me, a huge benefit. It's like when you say to your friends at the pool, "I'm going to go jump off the high dive." You kind of have to do it, <laughs> you know. You put your pride on the line, um, and it and it's like you said, it's on a schedule. It's every week you're checking in. Exactly. How to go? What are you doing next? How can we help you? What are you stuck on? Consistency, persistence. Yep. It's a beautiful thing. And see, we we come into this world and we've got our parents, yeah. and they're who they're looking out for us. And some people have you know better parents than others and better direction, so on and so forth. And and it comes to a point where you know you're you're being guided and you're being uh, led along this path, and you've got this support, and then it's like boom, you're left to your own yeah. devices all of a sudden, and that's not the way it should be. Right. You should always be having that support. Everybody should have a coach, and I think everybody should be in a mastermind group. Maybe you want to change the word of it. You might have this stigma to the word, but yeah. um, just accountability group works. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, when I bring up mastermind groups with people who have never heard of that phrase, they, they think like Dr. Evil or some kind of mm. Bond villain, you know? <laughs> like, no, not that kind of mastermind, the good kind, you know? Yeah, just if you want to feel better, yeah. if you want to eat better, if you want to lose weight, right. if you want whatever it is that you want to get, if you want to be funnier, mm. if you want to you know, be better at telling jokes, if you want to learn to juggle, if you just whatever it is that you want to learn or be better at, support helps. Yeah, and so, I mean, since we're on this, you coach people. Yes. What you know? What is it that you like to do, or what what do you offer? What do I offer? Well, to the point of I, we talk. We could go delve into target markets, and I like to focus on getting people on the right kind of sugars. And it seems to be a problem for a lot of people 
you know, the, the sugars talk about it being eight times more addictive than cocaine. That's one of the, the posts that you'll see fly around Facebook. Yeah. But we do, we tend to eat too much of the wrong sugars. So I like to it's a start, and it starts with food, but it's much more than that. When you're talking about your overall health and wellness, and we know this, we're, we've got the information, it's everywhere, it's at our fingertips, and we're seeing it on a continuous basis, especially on places like Facebook or wherever else it might be, in social media. And so we're, it's, we're overwhelmed with information. So what, what I provide is more transformation, mm-hmm. which is, I don't know exactly what you need in your life, but you know, but I can help you get there with the support mm-hmm. and with guidance and with asking certain questions. Well, how would it feel if you tried this? Or what about this? You know, there's certain a certain way to go about it. But you, as the client, know best. And it's about helping you get there. Again, support, guidance, and uh, with a series of little questions. And taking the little stance that I like to promote. Um, never really being overwhelming creating something that's 100% achievable because mm-hmm. you're playing a you're playing a game with the subconscious mind and in terms of you want to feel like a champ who doesn't want to feel like a champ so if you say right I'm going to do let's say it's yoga I'm going to do an hour of yoga tomorrow morning you get up tomorrow morning you're like oh, you look at your watch and you're like I don't have time and you spend the rest of the day feeling like feeling less yeah because you didn't do what you said you were going to do and that's a conscientiousness is linked with longevity. Um, saying you're going to do something and actually doing it, and it's really important. Yeah. And to a point where I've lost my train of thought. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> like, are, we, are we going to edit that? <laughs> I don't think that one was bad enough. I don't uh, think we'll need to edit that out. Right, I thought you were going to stop it. Um, but yeah, conscientiousness. You know, Saying you're going to do something and actually doing it. So back onto the little time frame. So instead of one hour of yoga, do five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes of yoga. You get up in the morning, this is the other thing, you plan the night before because you're planning the day that you're gonna have tomorrow. Mm-hmm. That you may or may not have, but there's a good chance you're gonna wake up. And when you do, you're prepped for it. Yeah. Your yoga mat's out on the floor and you do your five minutes of yoga. Yeah. And you've got it done and you spend the rest of the day feeling like a champ because you did yeah. what you said you were going to do. Yeah, you're setting yourself up to win. Exactly. And you know, I've there's actually a card in the Better Me game. I call it you call it little and I call it laughably easy goals, which 5 minutes of yoga is a perfect example. Nobody's going to stress out about that when they're trying to fall asleep. Oh my god, I need to do 5 minutes of yoga tomorrow. It's not like that, you know. But once you get started, a lot of time you, you get that momentum. I've set goals in the past to uh, run for 5 minutes on the beach when I was on an island in Thailand. And uh, I knew when I set that f- five minutes of running goal, that, or it might have been 10, whatever it was, it seemed easy. And I go, yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah, I'll go for a five-minute run. I put my shoes on, and it ends up being a 20-minute run because it's a beautiful beach, and I'm just cruising. And I, once I get in motion, I start feeling that momentum. And so it's a win if you do only five minutes, but you might do 20 minutes of yoga rather than saying you're going to do an hour and doing 20 minutes and feeling like, a, like you lost. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, going over it is fine, but I, yeah. I also sort of like to focus on a timer okay. so that it, it sets your mind on like, you know, this is it. It is, I'm going to do this amount of time so you can get on yeah. with your day and uh, feel like that, that champ that you are right. and continue with that game with the subconscious mind and then gradually you can increase your time once you've created the habit or once you've yeah. just created more confidence. You're building the confidence. Because every day you get up, you do five minutes of yoga, and after a week, you feel, you know, every day you're feeling more of a champ, and to a point where your confidence is built, and then you increase the time, because you're the sort of person that can do 20 minutes, because you're you're a champion. Right. Yeah. And where in the beginning you might need to be planning and you know blocking out time on your calendar and whatever, they say, you know, you build your habits, and then your habits build you, right? Yeah. So... You might have to think about it initially, but you used to have to think about brushing your teeth and tying your shoes too, right? So exactly. yoga will just become, you know, your your routine. It's it doesn't require any mental energy. You just do it and enjoy it. Yes, definitely. Yeah, and it's like, wow, well, what this is who I am now. Yeah. You just yeah, we are an amalgamation of our habits. So how can you bring in a new habit? And the best way to bring in a new habit, one of the best ways I find, and. Uh, 
not just myself, a lot of other uh, others out there, is to piggyback onto an existing habit. So you talked about brushing yeah. your teeth, and if I think if uh, your listeners were to take one thing out of this talk that they could incorporate into their lives, um, belly breathing. And this is something we tend to breathe way too much into the chest. Belly breathing controls your cortisol levels, which controls the autonomic nervous system and controls all your organs. Well, the breath does all of this. So when you focus on your breath, and so if you breathe deep in through the nose, hands under the belly button, let the breath push the belly out, hold it for as long as is comfortable, and then release through the mouth. And it's quite easy. You can try it, spend a few minutes on it. And this breathing, focusing on the breath, let's say if you're worrying, you're worrying about something, it's not going to help a situation. So focus on the breath. See that you're not letting the worry take root. It's quite nice. It works. And that in itself, belly breathing, when are you going to do it? It's this whole to know and not to do is not to know. So you know it. So how are you going to do it? And this is back onto the piggybacking it on an existing habit. So you're brushing your teeth in the morning, boom, belly breathing time, mm-hmm. and that's it. If that if that's what works for you, that, again, it's an individual process. Like sure. What works for you? Maybe it's waiting on someone. You're like, God damn it, where are they? Yeah, belly breathing time. You know what? I I'm not very consistent with it yet, but something I'm working on is using stoplights or don't walk signs or waiting for an elevator. Anything where I'm not allowed to move, I have to wait, just like you said, mm-hmm. um, to link that with trying to calm my thoughts. And prob- I, I haven't been thinking of, I should add breathing to that too, because I think that breathing will help me calm my mind. Let's, it's totally coming back to the breath. Like yeah. it's, it brings you into the present moment. When you focus on the breath, you can't focus on anything else. Mm-hmm. It's a, I think it was Deepak Chopra talks about uh, multitasking is the only thing that once done repetitively, we get worse at and we're not we're not multitaskers that's just the way we're built like if you're focusing on the breath and that's where your focus is at you can't be focused on that problem yeah. that you may or not have mm-hmm. yeah. right yeah um, I've heard uh, people talk about intentionally limiting your choices every day too like wardrobe choices little choices like that that take up small portions of your willpower, your attention, your decision-making energy, uh, trying to limit those choices so that you can focus on things that you're trying nice. to like, change. Yeah, like uh, Spider-Man or Batman. Or yeah, right. Like getting yourself a, an outfit yeah, of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I pretty much, the shorts I'm wearing right now are pretty much that for me. If I don't have some kind of important meeting and these shorts are clean, I'm wearing them. Nice. So there's one less decision every day. you know. And when they're not, you know, like if I go work out, go running in them and they're dirty, shoot, now I have to actually think, right? And I have some other shorts, but it's just kind of like automatic, bam. It's just like brushing my teeth. I pick up my black Adidas shorts. <laughs> you know? I like it. It's cool. One last thing to think about. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Anything to make your day go a little smoother. Mm-hmm. And so you work with people one-on-one mostly, is that right? One-on-one, yes. And uh, one-on-one at the moment, but I want to delve into, and this is I'm expanding my coaching business at the moment, and I want to delve into groups. Mm-hmm. I think it's a beautiful thing too when you get a group of people, I'm talking about a small group, uh, four or five members, and to gradually take steps back where eventually I'm no longer in the picture and they're helping yeah. each other out, but I'm setting them up and you know, taking them on my program and would that be on a specific topic like sugars or would it be more inclusive? Yeah, it would be on a specific to- yeah, topic. Right. And specifically, you know, you, I would I delve into taking people on a, on a journey that I was on. Mm-hmm. I used to drink a lot and I used to smoke a lot. And I didn't realize how shitty I felt yeah. until I stopped. And I said, holy crap, you know, and there's more things to do with life as opposed to being hungover. Um, and you're not everybody's ready for that journey. I'm not out there trying to you know, change people. I'm out there for people that are ready for change. Yeah. They want to come to me. I'm like, yeah, if you want some help, I can help you out because I've got a lot of experience yeah. in that road and I've got a lot of training and uh, put them all together and get you to where you want to get to. It's all about that feel good factor, that feel better yeah. well, you know, and getting you into that direction more, cool. so whatever it may take. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned good sugars too. Yeah. So I'm 
I want to guess because that's how I am. So good sugars would be like in fruit or I've heard about saccharides. What do you, or I want to hear what you have to say about yeah, good sugars, well, basically. Well, good sugars, the refined sugars is what you don't want. And then, then you're going into uh, carbs and uh, yeah. starches. And you want to, you really want to, the fruits, as you say, like you, one thing you do not want to be doing is juicing your fruit. You're taking all the good and the fiber away from uh, it. You want to, you want to be juicing the greens, if anything, yeah. not, not your fruit. And yeah, people are going to disagree. Um, this is the one thing with nutrition people can't seem to agree on it because it's an individual thing. It's a bio-individualistic yeah. field. One person's food is another person's poison. But yeah, the, uh, the refined sugars aren't doing us much much good. You're better with the, sticking with the fruits, yeah. natural fruits, um, eating them whole, putting them in a blender. And uh, yeah, the honey, raw honey is lovely. Um, but yeah, you can get... Yeah, I make some lovely desserts with just... You know, really ripe bananas, some raw cacao, coconut oil, some cashews, mm. and that's it. Like, there's no added sugar because you don't need it, and it's super sweet. Yeah. You know, I've heard. Okay, so modern fruit is different than fruit a long time ago, right? We we've bred all sorts of food that we eat, right, from animals to fruit and everything. It makes me think of you know I'm from Washington State, which is like the apple capital of the world. Um, you see a lot of New Zealand apples and a lot of Washington apples. Anywhere I go, I always look at the apples to see what stickers on them. Anyway, apples now you can, and I think you know it's it's because they can sell you more weight. A lot of apples are like the size of a softball. You know, like they're getting to be like a cantaloupe size apple. You know, what size is a softball? Uh, exactly. About like about go like on this, here. like a small cantaloupe. Uh, what else is the size of a softball? Yeah, like like more like uh, the size that like, yeah, a small cantaloupe or a large like what grapefruit or something would be about that big okay um, but anyway they're getting huge <laughs> right but three four times the size of a golf ball uh that be right like bigger than a baseball smaller than a volleyball right in there. okay i got gotcha. you yeah <laughs> <laughs> we got there yeah i'm trying to think of what do people throw around in ireland <laughs> uh, rocks a medium-sized rock yeah <laughs> so no no it's, uh, it's just messing yeah um Billiard balls. I should have said something about that. Uh, Maybe like go, yeah. two billiard balls side by side, almost. Right. Make that a sphere. Yeah. Anyway, um, they're big. And there's a lot of sugar in an apple that big too, right? Um, and so, I mean, I think especially when, if you're juicing, even if they're good sugars, you can end up with a ton of sugars yes. in a glass of juice, right? That's a lot of... You don't want that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to... You can eat a, a baseball size apple or, a, you know, whatever that would be to you, a double golf ball size apple. Um, and that's a great little snack, you know. You don't have to go too crazy on it. Yeah, exactly. I eat the whole fruit. Like this is the, the whole. We seem to set up uh, today's a uh, diet. Really, we've really fucked with it. Mm-hmm. Really mastered it. It's like we don't focus on what we're eating. We're distracted and we're looking at technology. Yeah, we're. We need to chew. It's like an afterthought for some people, isn't it? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm starving right now. What's near me? Yeah. Um, I think of, not all the time, but in a lot of ways, you know, it depends on the type of day that I'm having. You know, if I'm having a, a really, get a lot, you know, productive day, get a lot of stuff done, food is mostly like fuel to me. And so if I'm in the middle of a work day and I'm eating lunch, I will try to avoid things that I know make me feel drowsy. Um, portions will probably be smaller until I'm done. Like in the evening, I might eat a little more. Um, but then, you know, on a leisurely day, I think of food as more like an experience. You know, something you, a lot of people take pictures of their food and put it on their Facebook page or their Instagram or whatever. Um, but I think primarily for me, food is fuel, you know. And so yes. water, um, understanding, you know, when you've had enough. Uh, avoiding, for me, too much, you know, we're in Thailand, there's rice with a lot of dishes. If I have too much rice at lunch, I get sleepy to where I pretty much just need to call it quits and take a nap for a little bit and then come back when I wake yeah, up. Yeah, and that, well, that's, a lot of people think that's normal and that's the sort of thing. It's You, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And so a lot of people aren't in tune with you know how they should really be feeling and they yeah. don't realize that you should be eating a meal and then you should feel more energized. Right. And that's where you should be. In regards to food, what you're eating is either energizing you, helping you flourish, or it's, it's poisoning you. It's like, you know, food... Food is a good thing and it's a bad thing. It doses everything and it's also yeah. that bio-individualistic arena. It's, yeah. it could, this certain food could be damaging your health and you slowly, mm-hmm. slowly it could be doing 
uh, some damage. So the best thing that you can do, the number one thing you can do for uh, as a person to increase your health and wellness is to do an elimination diet. Mm. And you can Google that and you can find some information. I think uh, Mind Body Green have a program there. And that is the best. It takes a little bit of work. It's the best thing you can do for yourself. You spend about three to four weeks uh, eliminating five of the, the bad boys. And uh, What are those? Well, can I guess? I love guessing. Yeah, go ahead. Sugar. Yeah. Caffeine. Yeah. I don't know if this is really food. Alcohol? Is that are they put? Well, yes. Yeah. Okay. It's something that's not. So the point is to give you the power. So yeah. let's say alcohol, for example, yeah. you stop drinking it for two, three weeks, and then you introduce it back into your diet on its own. And you have a beer, and you check into how you're feeling, uh-huh. and that's you want that aha moment where yeah. it's like, holy shit. You know, this is whatever it is you, you you might actually be surprised at how you feel after it because you're tuning in this is the thing you're not just drinking it mindlessly you're drinking the beer and you're checking in how do I feel do I feel good or do I feel shitty or do I feel groggy uh, tired how is this substance that I'm putting into my body making me feel mm-hmm. and once you get that ah then you can make it a more conscious choice so that the next time that you go drink a beer you know but you can still drink the beer and enjoy it, but know that you're going to feel a certain way. You know, afterwards. it's funny that you use the word groggy, too. I listened to a podcast that talks about words. Uh, I can't even remember what it's called right now, but the root of words is interesting to me. I don't know why. But groggy comes from grog, which is like, I don't, what was it, rum? It was whatever they had on ships that they would drink, and they would get a certain amount every day. But okay. it would make them, you know, so feeling groggy is exactly how you feel after you have a, an alcoholic beverage. You know, right. that's the root of the word. It's like, uh, you know. <laughs> and I'm sure, like you said, it's a little bit different for everybody. Mm. Um, you know, I, I was listening to somebody talk not too long ago about now we're at the point where you can analyze your own individual genetic makeup um, and and this is something I'm far from an expert on, but it was interesting to me that basically you can look at how your body is made and look at the likelihood of how you react to different things. And maybe I don't. Do you have any experience with that? Getting uh, basically, I don't know if it's your gene sequence or something similar to kind of have a decent guess and starting point for eliminating or customizing diet. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know there, there's a lot of research going into that. Yeah. that I can't speak of it's, it. But seems definitely. like it's just kind of becoming yes. a thing, Yeah, which is interesting. It's something I think I'm going to keep an eye on over the next few nice. years. Nice. Yeah. And just on a side note, I wasn't dishing alcohol there. There's obviously, you've got like lots of really good wines, uh, resveratrol, great for longevity. And then uh, you've got these micro breweries. You've got some quality beers out there. But it's just, again, I think in regards to food, you've got to be a food detective. Yeah. You've really got to look, what's in this? Right. You know, you've got, um, I, think I was reading an article recently about uh, the, the, the science babe, I think she's called, and she's... She's calling out the food babe, which is, uh, you know, the food babe basically says, um, if you can't pronounce it, then, you know, the, if you can't pronounce the ingredient, don't eat it. And the yeah. science babe goes, well, you know, sometimes this thing that you can't pronounce is still not harmful for you. Yeah. But, um, I th- and I think what's going on there, there's a dispute, but it's, we're overloaded with chemicals and uh, try and keep the products that you're buying to, you know, three, four, five ingredients and hopefully you can pronounce them and you know what they are. Right. That's It's better, but it's, you know, because yeah. um, we're definitely <clears throat> over-chemicalized. Yeah, I think people tend to look at things as black and white and sometimes oversimplify. I think it was Einstein said, make things as simple as you can, but not more simple. Or some, <laughs> something to that effect. Okay. You know, and like maybe there's a some French word you can't say and it's awesome for you, right? Like, yeah. come on. Okay, you get the point. Right? The point is there are a bunch of weird chemicals and things that, and additives and preservatives that you can't pronounce. Okay, got it. It's a great way to remember it kind of as like a rule of thumb. Exactly. Yeah. But, rule you know, thumb. just because this fruit grows in some country with a weird language doesn't mean, you know, well, I can't say the name of that fruit. Better not eat it. You yeah. know, like, come on. You know, that's where critical thinking comes in, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, nice. So now um, the Institute for Integrative Medicine. In, no. No, no, I'm wrong. Yes. You studied at the Institute of for Integrative Nutrition. Nutrition. That was just me typing the wrong word. Okay, right. Nutrition. Mm-hmm. So is this where you started to look into ideas like we're talking about, or was it more, I mean, what did they teach you there? What's that all about? Well, my journey, first of all, started quite a long time ago. Um, okay. 
it was sort of it was a personal thing. Um, I'm not really sure. I I stopped drinking tea back in 1995 um, through a gradual process and ended up realizing that um, I enjoyed hot water. And from there, I sort of continued to realize that you can acquire a taste for anything really if yeah. you put your mind to it. And so I started delving into things that were a little healthier for me because I knew that, or I was told that they were healthier, you know, fermented foods. And like, oh, I'm going to get to like this because it's good for me. Yeah. Um, all the while drinking up a storm of alcohol and uh, lots of cigarettes. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was, yeah. I had some sort of a balance going on. Um, and then I got into uh, yoga and meditation about, it's about five years ago. And that quite so a gradual change. And I would say about the same time, we're starting to get into green smoothies. And so I would have my green smoothie in the morning and start my day off like a champ. And then I'd spend the rest of the day drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes and eating lots of really shitty food. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it was a start, you know, you small changes. Yeah, yeah. I eventually got there, and I thought I wanted to take it a step further. And I started studying with the, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Cool. And where is that? Um, that's a course based in New York. Okay. Um, and it's a very, very cool course, and I definitely recommend it. If you want to, if you want a life changer, a course that's going to change your life, delve into it, and to be a good coach. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, you've got all the great teachers on there. Deepak's there. Um, Julia Cameron from The Artist's Way. Uh, Andrew Whale. I'm trying to think who else. That's um, David the guy Wolf. that looks like Santa Claus, right? Yeah, that's yeah he's Claus. awesome. I love his yeah. stuff. I've listened to some of his audiobooks. For whatever reason, his stuff really hits home with me. I um, like it. Mark, Mark Hyman. Um, there's a lot of really good teachers. Yeah, a great course. Um, yeah. They call it not just a course, but a movement. Because it's definitely what we need in today's world. We need people that are more consciously aware of uh, what choices we should be making and helping people get there. Yeah. I think, I mean, an important thing to look at anytime you're getting information is what's the motivation of the person putting this information out, right? And I think, I mean, it's clear to me you're trying to help people. Commercials on TV, ads in newspapers, all that kind of stuff. It makes me think of uh, like Splenda. I can't believe it's not butter. All these, oh, it's this amazing new product. It's going to revolutionize your life and yeah. make everything better. You know, it's the magic bullet. Um, uh, That's what I'm saying. I'm going to revolutionize your life. I'm going to revolutionize your life. Is that what I'm saying? Is, is that what I'm no. saying you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> yeah, but, um, you know, use, I mean, critical, it comes back to critical thinking, right? And yes. experimentation, finding out what's best for you. Yeah. Um, you know, we all, a lot of us have ideas that have been put there over many years and we don't even realize the motivation of the people who put them there. Like, um, you know, again, I don't have anything against milk, but how many milk ads have you seen yeah. versus how many ads have you ever seen that said, eat your fruit and juice your vegetables, right? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> um, just because something said a lot doesn't always mean it's right. So exactly, think. yes. Think. Yeah. And yeah, well, I, think, I can't remember who said it, but uh, anything that's on TV advertised, don't, don't go near it. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> No, because they need to. Why do they need to advertise this? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's well, one, you know, one person's opinion. Uh, something interesting about advertising. Um, what was his name? I always blank on his name. He was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Oh, I hate it that I can't remember his name. Uh, he basically started the PR industry. Um, it's right on the tip of my tongue. What doesn't really matter. That's my own issue. <laughs> I need to get over it. Who cares? Still sort it. Who cares what the guy's name is? But basically, they went from. Uh, if you look at old advertisements, they're hilarious. Uh, drink Coke. Drink Coca-Cola. You know, I, I used to run a flea market, and we had a bunch of old advertisements. People love it, right? But it would just be like a command. Do this. <laughs> Drive a Ford. You know, drink a Coca-Cola. Um, that was about as, you know, eat this. And then they somewhere along the way, this guy figured out that, oh, Bernays. Uh, Edward Bernays, I believe. Okay. Um, he realized that what you want to do is get people to associate coke or ford or whatever with some emotional thing so you see it a lot with luxury cars you yeah, know like very oh, clever man the classical music is playing look at this beautiful sunset that it's driving into and all you know this beautiful woman sitting next to this guy all i need to do is buy one of these and then i'll have all that um you just associate the brand with that feeling and so you'll see this with a lot of uh like coke ads um 
a lot of Christmas, like holiday season ads, they'll spend the whole ad. You don't even know what the ad is for until the very end. So they might have this family sitting around a fire, you know, laughing, you know, everybody's together and happy and there's food everywhere. Everything's good. They're warm, even though it's snowing outside. And then at the last second, they flash like the Coke logo or some other similar thing that, you know, they're trying to tie you in with that warm and fuzzy feeling. They're very clever. Yeah. Mm. So... A, avoid that stuff if you can for the most part, I think. Uh, and B, you can rewire your, you know, you've been programmed to associate some of these things. Well, that's it. You, Americans call it something different, but we call it a TV program. Yeah. And yeah, I threw my TV out quite a few years ago and was really glad. And But I've got my laptop computer and I choose what I want to watch. Yeah, right. And I don't watch advertisements. Yeah. They creep up now and again on... A, on YouTube yeah they're more common than they used to be yeah um, but they're generally they're generally Thai yeah that's true so it's, it's like you can't like really understand what they're trying to do I can't understand what they're saying yeah. so it doesn't matter really. you know I'm, I mean this might seem weird to some people out there but I I mean some people it'll seem like a great idea I hit on my computer it's function escape which just instantly mutes whatever so if the ad comes up I just mute it beautiful <clears throat> and nice. even usually if I mean it takes a little bit of discipline but I'll try to just either look away from the screen or close my eyes, anything other than just soaking up that programming. Like you said, pet my dog for 10 seconds or whatever. Nobly, yeah. With, you know, YouTube, usually you can skip it after five, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's 20 seconds and yeah. nothing you can do about it. But. Yeah, this is what it is, isn't it? You just got to try and limit your exposure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have a mute button on your TV or whatever works for you. Just, yeah, realize, just like you need to watch what you're putting in your stomach, you know, through your mouth, your food, watch what's going into your brain through your ears and your eyes. Right? Yeah, it's your, your physical diet and your emotional yeah. diet. It's, it's, they all play a big part. Yeah. Like a part of my coaching, the guy delve into primary food and secondary food. And secondary food would be, you know, let's say eating local, organic, seasonal produce, which helps out the world in a big way. You're eating locally. It's not being shipped over from thousands of miles um, getting to know your farmer so that's secondary food but then primary food overrides that and that's your relationships with your brother sister your next door neighbor like how do you feel when you when you check in and think about a certain person maybe it's a work colleague how do you feel about them because if you're feeling off if you're feeling negatively then that's that's a uh, adding to your overall well you know, sickness or it's just building up disease slowly. Yeah. It can be. Yeah. So your relationships, number one. Your career, are you happy in your job? And if you're not happy in it, well, what can you do to make it a little better? Bring in some flowers, some pictures of loved ones, make up with the work colleague, brighten up your desk. You know, there's certain things that you can do. It's not just quit your job. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, there's certain things that you can actually do if you focus on it to make your work a more pleasant environment so you've got your career you've got your relationships your career your spirituality again you know, walk in the park connecting with nature getting out into the forest go camping get out of the city <laughs> and uh, your physical exercise you know, getting out and moving your body in a way that makes you happy yeah. as opposed to maybe well maybe running in the treadmill Maybe that does make you happy. Maybe that's fine. But if it's not, again, it's an individual thing. If you're not happy running on a treadmill, then do something else that lights you up. Rock climb, dance, dance in the shower. There's lots of ways to get that physical activity and uh, do the one that lights you up. Yeah. Yeah, that's that automatic feedback. You're getting it whether you want it or not, right? Mm. Something's bumming you out, stressing you out, yeah. making you feel anxious. Your whole body's listening. Listen, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that that told that this negativity, or like oh, people give it a, a bad rap, but that negativity is it's your guidance system. Mm-hmm. It's like guiding you to what you do want. Because the more you know what you don't want, then you've got a clearer idea of what you do want. Yeah, you know, I don't want this. Okay, so then let's steer to the other direction. Yeah, it's it's very cool. And it's, once you learn how to harness it and check in with it, it can really help you out. Yeah. Um, speaking of things that light you up and you know help you just feel that sense of fulfillment you've been you told me you were working on a new project which is cool which is candles yeah (laughs) yes yeah and uh beeswax candles yeah Yeah. and so tell me about that and how does that make you feel ah brilliant just love it absolutely love it um my part of my journey I, i started consuming a lot of honey um when i was living in south korea so much so that i decided to learn to become a beekeeper 
and in that venture I ended up making a, one of the lessons was making beeswax candles put a bit of time into it and left it at that and I've just yeah I've just recently got back into it and I'm just loving making these candles and I'm making them and giving them to people at the moment and um, it's nice it's that thing you know, I, I've, I've made, I made this I give it yeah. to you yeah. and uh, it's it's pretty cool because you've got a beautiful candle that purifies the air um, such a wonderful thing and at night time just glows there's no comparison to the glow of a beeswax candle to an ordinary candle it's got a more beautiful glow and trust me once you go onto the beeswax candle end of things it's very difficult to go back to any other kind of candle mm. huh I never thought about the glow being different oh yeah it's just, it's just this warm glow huh beautiful I'll give you one yeah I'm You're curious to one. see I want to see it side by side or in two different rooms or something I want yeah. to compare yes. I never heard of that I guess I just assumed that the whole beeswax thing is just you know it's more natural blah blah, blah. it's not made in some factory as much or mm-hmm. whatever um, hmm I'm curious now thank you yeah, I'd love to check out one of your candles. Yeah, indeed. Especially, <laughs> it's not uncommon to lose power here, too. <laughs> yeah, it happens quite go. a bit. When the rainy season comes around, it happens a lot. It's always good to have a candle ready. Yeah. 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 I've got about five lighters right behind me, but no candles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay. And also, so back to yoga for a second. That's something that you're enthusiastic about, another thing that lights you up, right? Definitely, with other dot, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, what does it do for you? I mean, because the reason I asked that, so you're just trying to become more flexible, right? No. Oh. Um, <laughs> so I'm joking. Yeah. I think a lot of people but still some people do get into that. that. Yeah, well, it is. It's cool. Who doesn't want to be more flexible? Yeah. This is one thing that it gives you, especially I delve more into yin yoga, which um, does, it creates a lot of flexibility because yeah. you, you get into long holes and the, the more you can relax, the more the belly of the muscle and the fascia the connective tissue relax and release yeah. giving you more flexibility if you think of uh, a wet sponge it's springiness that's yeah. what you get so with the correct water and uh, yin yoga and you've got yourself a nice supple <laughs> elastic body my story on that is the very first time I ever did uh, Bikram yoga the uh, hot yoga, hot yoga. Oh, really hot yoga yeah. uh, a guy kept telling me he was so enthusiastic about it. you should go you should go you should go I go twice a week or whatever three times a week and I said yeah maybe maybe and then for Christmas he got me a gift certificate for two sessions so I went and the very first session was the only time to that point in my life that I'd ever touched my nose to my knee okay. with my leg straight obviously yeah. Um, and yeah man wow I mean in one session and you know it's not like I could always touch my toes and stuff so I wasn't horribly inflexible but that was far beyond how how much I'd been able to stretch my hamstring yeah. out ever well this just just to point out here I, I definitely don't advocate that like the, <laughs> the, the, the you do not like you've got to honor where you're this is yeah. one of the problems and people are like they really want to have their hands flat on the floor they yeah. want they want to they see someone else you know touching their toes and it's not really it's not about that it's about yeah. honoring where your body's at if, if you think of uh, braces for your teeth slowly gradually right. change the right. body that's where the magic is slowly gradually enjoy the process getting into that stationary pose and following the breath coming back to the breath and the more you relax the more again as I said before that the, the belly of the muscle can release and knowing that you'll get to that point sometime in the future yeah. it's all about that consistency and keep doing it and again focusing on the breath and you're getting comfortable in an uncomfortable situation where you're feeling that stretch and that retrains the brain also um, where you can be you know, on your motorbike mm-hmm. and in your car driving and some idiot cuts in front of you and it retrains the brain where you're more relaxed in those situations where you're like yeah it's okay yeah and that's I actually sidetracked my own point because that's really what I was getting at I think I know I used to at one point think that yoga I thought of it more of like a sport this is what you do to become more flexible but it's a lot more than that yeah and uh, so like the benefit of not having the road rage come up or yeah, it calms the mind to, yeah. again coming back to the breath there's so many uh, advantages to just getting into it and it's uh, they call it the tip of the iceberg just the asinus you just get into that you just get into that uh, being a better person yeah um, and slowly but surely 
you know, you start, if, especially if you're going to yoga classes, then you're hanging out with people that are interested yeah, in yoga, right. and you, they talk about, you know, you're most like who you're hanging around. They tend to eat pretty well. Yeah. You know, yeah, one thing leads to another. You can't really separate all these different parts of your life, right? You go to yoga, you feel good, you're probably going to sleep better. You know, then, oh, you sleep better, the next day you're less irritable. The the practice of yoga plus the fact that you're well-rested, oh, now I'm not yelling at the guy in traffic. I'm not yelling at the guy in traffic. When I get home, I'm nicer to my family. It's yeah. just that, you know, you're, you're spiraling up. You can Sometimes you can spiral down, you know, but exactly. sometimes just small decisions and actions, the whole concept of the little thing that we talked about yeah. earlier can really lead to that snowball effect. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and that's it. Like you... You know, so as opposed to going to one yoga class once a week, brilliant start. But you know, uh, talking to the yoga instructor after class about one pose, and doing that one pose in the morning, yeah. spending three minutes on it, and that's it. Yeah. Do your three minutes every morning. Everybody's got three minutes. Right. And again, to know and not to do is not to know. Yeah. So right. set yourself up the night before with your yoga mat. Yeah. You know where it's going to be seen. So you wake up, sure. you see it, and do your three minutes. Yeah. You know. Um, an example of that for me lately has been I used to be kind of a gym rat like back in high school and then shortly after high school I was in the weight room a lot and you know that was something I did like minimum three times a week five or six times a week a lot of weeks and uh, sometimes I'd go work out twice in a day and whatever I liked it so that's cool but yes, yeah. you know now and I made friends there like you're talking about with your yoga buddies you know I'd, that's where I'd kind of had a social circle there and, and that was all good but um, then lately, I haven't been in that mode of going to the gym that often. But I have, uh, you know, what a TRX is. It's like a thing yes. that you hang from. You can adjust the length. So you yeah. can do, like, different kinds of pull-ups on it. You can do dip type of things. You can do stretches on it, um, leg raises and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, I just always have it hanging. Like, you can see it out the window probably, maybe. Anyway, it's hanging right outside. So even if I have a day where I either think I don't have time or really don't have time to go to a gym, I can go outside and do pull-ups for three minutes. Yes, you know, nice. I can do, uh, that's my yoga mat kind of right there. I don't do it often. I'm not very consistent, but you know, when I need a little brain break or some time to go relax, I can go stretch over there on that little carpet. Mm, um, nice. you know, there's plenty of room to do pushups in almost any place. Even if you're in jail, you can do pushups, right? Um, exactly. Just, it's basically, I'm at the point where I've built a habit. Like, I don't feel like I don't have to plan going out there to do some pull-ups. It's like, oh, I walk by it, there it is, let's do some. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And just, yeah, again, just, yeah, creating a little habit. Yeah. Putting a little planning, you plan it yeah. a little. Yeah, and I use those short little exercise periods, too, to take a break. If my brain's kind of fried, I've been typing or reading too much or something, I'll just go outside and either do some stretching or some pull-ups or some push-ups or whatever, play with my dog, just a quick little, I'm moving, you yes, know, it yeah. brings that... A, my brain gets a break from kind of thinking, and then I'm moving the blood and breathing and all that. So very nice, yeah, very beneficial. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what ha have we not covered? Something you want to cover? Because I've got a big list, but I don't want to just <laughs> hijack the whole thing. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think we're really going into it. So. Yeah. Um, I told you it really can get going, and you just say, wait. How long has it been? It's been an hour. Wow, you know. Um, yeah, we're at an hour right now. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, hardships, failures, setbacks. Um, I'm sure you've never had one, but you probably know somebody who has, right? What do you think about failures? Fa failures? <laughs> yeah. my, my most recent failure is not getting up at 5.30 in the morning. This is what I've set for myself. Okay. And uh, I'm not doing it. So this is I'm delving into this. Why am I not doing it okay. at the moment and sort of coaching myself? But yeah. uh, again... Um, I this is something I, I will have to bring up with my peer coach and it's yeah um, I just started it I'm not doing it and I said why why am I not yeah. doing it and again I might have to take my own advice and uh, go for a more little approach and just start waking up at 7 yeah and then maybe waking up at 6:45 the right. next week yeah. and so this is that's one thing I'm looking into but at the moment I have failed mm -hmm. and Again, stepping into conscientiousness, you know, it's saying you're going to do something and doing it, feeling more of a champ. I'm saying yeah. I'm going to do something and I'm not doing it, and that is not, it's not good for your health. <laughs> right. So it's a matter of, okay, changing the approach, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, so this, something isn't working, can I identify it? Can I try something else? Yeah. So uh, my next step will be to um, set 
smaller little increments yeah. of and just slowly so next week I'll start getting up at 7 yeah and within the course of maybe three months I'll be at 5.30 right. hopefully right. then again you got to look into well, you know, how much do I really want to do this because if I, you, know, you look into that maybe I don't really want to get up at 5.30 and that's the other thing if all you had to do was get up at 5.30 walk across the street and push a button and receive a million dollars you'd probably do it right? oh, I would definitely <laughs> yeah, I, would, if, I would do that if yeah. you're not seeing the value it's like hmm how can, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm kind of a quote junkie partly because I have a Facebook page that posts tons of quotes all the time but uh, I think I'm pretty sure it was Emerson said, all of life is an experiment. The more experiments you make, the better. Yeah, it's nice. You know, you're just always getting a little closer to what works, right? Yeah. We're never, we never have it perfect and on autopilot. Look at me. My life is perfect. Let me teach you how to do this, right? Oh, yeah. Like, you know, Forever the student, forever yeah. the teacher, yeah. Oh, I heard a cool thing the other day. Uh, I forget his name, but the guy that started judo, I think he was the guy that started it or one of the very early judo guys. Um, so like hugely respected had you know a black belt with you know there's degrees of black belt I think going up I don't know how high they go some guys I hear are like eight nine tenth degree black belt blah, blah, blah. so I'm sure he was up there and uh, he asked when he was he was old I don't know if he was sick or whatever he requested to be buried in his white belt nice isn't that awesome it's pretty cool yeah. it's so cool and such a cool message to all his students and everything bury me in my white belt yeah nice. you know I'm forever a student like yeah that's said. beautiful yeah yeah, so that would be uh, that would be my one of my failures at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and you just well, what are they really? Your failures, or you know, you just you just keep going. You it's don't just, focus. Just on an them. event, right? Exactly. It's not you. Event. Yes, it's yeah. just yeah, you did that. Yeah, it's in the past now. Each failure is bringing you closer to your yeah. your success. But yeah, it's all about enjoying the process too. Right, and it's again, it's if if what you're doing you're not enjoying, well then maybe just do something else yeah. that you are going to enjoy because that's that's it. You know, to be more process orientated as opposed to um, outcome orientated am I getting that right <laughs> yes it's the journey not the destination exactly right? yeah. same thing um, I don't know if again you're from Ireland in America baseball is like the national pastime right so uh, Babe Ruth who have you heard that name a little bit he's kind of like I, the Pele of baseball he's the guy that hit all the home runs yeah he yeah. changed the whole game he made the home run a big part of the game before that it was kind of a rare thing it happened once in a while but nobody was really trying to do it you know he had um, not to get too off into baseball world but Ty Cobb was like one of the best players ever before Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb was more of a base hit steal second you know like a they call it small ball you know one base at a time scoring runs making it happen as opposed to you know swinging for the fences but also striking out a lot Mm. which is what Babe Ruth did. So anyway, what I'm getting at, Babe Ruth hit a ton of home runs, and that's what everybody talks about, but he held the record for most career strikeouts for I think it was either 29 or 30 years. And the guy who broke it, if you can guess, if you're listening out there and you're a baseball fan, do you know who broke Babe Ruth's record for career strikeouts? It was Mickey Mantle, another Hall of Famer, and one of the other like biggest legends in the sport. Um, He was playing in the 50s. He was my dad's hero. Um, you know, nobody talks about that. You know, they talk about, um, you know, who broke the home run record and Lou Gehrig and exactly. Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds and Babe Ruth, all these home run hitters. But, you know, these guys struck out a ton. Yes. And they asked Mickey Mantle, um, somebody asked him, which is, I don't know, it seems like a silly question to me. Did you ever step up there trying to hit a home run? And his response was, every time. <laughs> Simple. <That's> it, yeah. <laughs> he didn't pretend. Every time, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, like you can't be afraid to fail. Just get out there and swing. Yeah. Nike say it best and just do it. Yeah. 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 I mean, even I, I'm a big fan of biographies. Like um, the reason is I think we tend to put our heroes up on this pedestal and and it's cool to have heroes. But you have to be careful how you think about them because if you think that they were perfect and they're something that you're not, you kind of you give up your power to ever be great if you think that they were just some crazy talented individual at birth you know what i mean so um like things that people commonly don't know about their heroes you know muhammad ali had his jaw broken in the ring you know um what somebody broke muhammad ali's jaw i thought that guy was perfect i thought he was untouchable his entire life yeah you know not at all mickey mantle almost quit baseball when he was in the minor leagues his dad came with a suitcase and said you want to come back and be a coal miner for the rest of your life like i am you know you want to do that come on jump in the car or are you going to stay here you know are you going to are you going to get through this yeah this is the reality that's not uh, yeah. focused on yeah. enough 
that's it. I guess if I'm, again, we're trying to give a gem every time, a gem that I would try to give listeners right now is pick a hero of yours that you don't really know that much about and go find a biography. And almost without fail, you will learn about some failure, setback, or near miss that they had. You know, um, Colin Farrell, he's Irish. You, you know that actor, Colin Farrell? Um, uh, I do. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think either one of us are like watching TV all day, really. But Colin Farrell uh, got his big break in a movie called Tigerland, and uh, he's like this—he's like the Brad Pitt of Ireland, pretty much. I yeah, think. I know who this guy. Yeah, is. Yeah. yeah. So he's really good-looking guy, and uh, big eyebrows. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And uh, but you know, he was bouncing around in little theaters. I think his sister was real into theater too, and uh, he was doing a show, I think, in Dublin, somewhere in Ireland. And this Hollywood producer guy just happened to be there in the audience, you know. And this wasn't his first play. You know, this guy had been bouncing around in little theaters. I don't, I mean, I'm guessing they were paying him something, but, you know, he was nothing big. Well, hopefully he was enjoying it. Yeah, right, right, right. right. And he did, you know. And his sister got him all enthusiastic about it. It was a family thing. Um, And he's good. Yeah. yeah. I've seen a few of his. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's, you know, I think he's one of those guys a lot of people almost write him off. Oh, he's just there because he's good looking. Is he? You know, go look into it. Go look into the story. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, to me, that really fires me up when I realize that guys who are now doing something amazing and getting these extraordinary results at some point were wow, they're kind of like people I know, or kind of like me. You know, there's they just kept going on. Yeah, the belief. Yeah, it's all about the belief. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Having those failures, building those skills. It wasn't you know talent. They weren't born with it. They were skills that were developed. Of course, everybody has some amount of you know, natural ability, but nobody has enough to be like a Michael Jordan without practicing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just having the belief and then believing that you can get to that next step. They talk about your goal. Your goal is whatever is right yeah. next, whatever is right in front of you. Yeah. Like that's what your goal is to get that step closer. Yeah. It's like climbing the stairs. It's one step at a time. Right. I was just, um, there's a free course. I keep telling everybody about it cause it's so cool that it's free. Um, Positive Psychology 1504 at Harvard, taught by Tal Ben Shahar. Um, he, it's all on YouTube and probably in other places. I don't know, but all the lectures are there. And he was talking about um, the difference between people that envision the result, which is what I've most commonly been like told. You envision your results. So if you want to be an Olympic gold medalist or something, you're seeing yourself on the podium wearing the gold medal. You're closing your eyes. You're you're hearing the crowd. You're feeling the breeze on your face or whatever. You know, in detail, right? But um, there have been studies that show that people who visualize the process actually get even better results. Like visualization is good. You know, start doing it even if you're not doing it perfectly. But basically, visualizing <clears throat> the training session, the bus ride to the training center. You know who your your partner is when you're working on it. You know, like yeah, your next step. Yeah, your next step. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Focusing on that process. And, you know, I had a coach that used to say, "Practice doesn't make perfect. Pra- perfect practice makes perfect, and practice just makes permanent." Yeah, <laughs> you know. Good, yeah. So that process is key. <clears throat> it's not just about the hours you're putting in. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. What have you got to do? Who have you got to talk to? Yeah. What have, what have you got to do to get you that step closer? And yeah, the visualizing. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, there's actually a card in the Better Me game that says to visualize your ideal day, and it's only one minute, but it actually seems like kind of a long time sometimes when you get into it. <clears throat> and uh, that visualization is something that. I probably should do more of it. Every time it comes up in a game, I love it. At the end of that exercise, I just feel so good. You know, visualizing that ideal day down to the detail, like smelling things, feeling the breeze, hearing noises, you know. Um, yeah, visualization is a, a cool thing, powerful tool. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me check my list here. Well, oh, um, <clears throat> something, if you have anything you want to throw out, I'm always curious if people have any... Um, real like X's and O's tips like apps on your phone tools that you use little hacks any little details you want to mention um, and again I'm putting you on the spot but if, if you have anything like that I'm always curious what people are using um, well, I, I've been carrying a notebook around for about 10 years and buddy Keith got me into it I take it everywhere with me right I remember you showing me that and, and it's, it's small it's small it's a little notebook with a pen it yep. always has a pen inside it, just slides into the side. And anything of importance gets written in there. And um, whatever it is that comes up, like I 
a function and escape to mute. There you go, written in it. Yeah, but, cool. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, nice. And whatever, whatever it is that uh, I want to remember, that I can just get it out of my head and into the book. Yeah. And so I don't need to focus on it anymore. Right. And I take the book everywhere with me, and eventually I'll look back on what I had written. And you know, then if I'm on the computer and I can Google it, or if I want to research more into it, I rem- I don't need to remember it because yeah. I've got it written down, right. and I can focus on other things. And I'll come back to it later. It's a beautiful thing. I've, yeah, I've been doing it as I said for ten years, and wow, it was a real game changer for me. Yeah. Do you also keep it near your bed at night? No. Okay. I can't say I do now. Because that's something I'd actually have to check and see if it's still there. I usually have a pen and bed near my bed. Oh, well, that's that's something different. I have another book for that. Oh, you do? Not, okay, cool. Not this notebook. Same deal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah for the same reason, you know. Like, well, it's that's more for just writing down dreams. And, oh, okay, um, yeah. But and, and any thoughts that come up. But usually now it's like this notebook is specifically for yeah. the day-to-day things. Right. Um, and again, you know, with music too, I'm also a musician and a songwriter, so you know, I'll get a melody or I'll get a, a lyrics that will come into my head. Yeah. They've got to be jotted down in a notebook. Right away. Yeah. You know, for me, I notice, even say I wrote everything down in a notebook and then somebody stole it, you know. I actually remember those things. Just the, the exercise of writing them down, I'm more likely to think of them and remember them, even if I never read it again. Yeah. Sometimes I'll come across a note that I put in a book and then put it in the wrong spot or something quite a long time later and I'll realize that hey I actually remembered that without reviewing it yeah there's definitely something that happens when you put pen to paper yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's true somewhere between your brain and your hand <clears throat> something's going on yes um, do you this is one of my general questions here um, do you set goals like written goals I do okay definitely yeah. um, and it, Again, it's like, what is it like? You can say, all right, I want to get this, do this, be this. Um, and the way I would set my goal is I go for a walk. Okay. And no technology into nature, go for a long walk and maybe meditate for a while, but generally walking and really hone in on what I want, what I really want, what lights me up. Yeah, when you think about it, that end goal, again, you can be visualizing and does it light you up? And if it lights me up, that's what I think, right, that's what I want. And if that's the end goal, then I break it down into chunks from that and break it down into smaller chunks. Let's say it's a three-year goal. This is where I want to be in three years. Boom. Where is that going to be in one year? Yeah. Where's, what's going to be happening in six months? What's going to be happening in three months? What do you need to do in three months that's going to get you closer? So if you're breaking these, this, the big goal into smaller chunks of tasks that you're going to have to do mm-hmm. down to the point of... You know what? What am I going to have to do this week to get, that gets me closer to my task? And it's a beautiful thing yeah. when you get what's going to light you up, what what you really, really want, and then break it down. Then it's if you really, really want it, and if you really know that you're going to enjoy the process of getting there, then it's it becomes really easy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. are you? So just I, I like to get really nitpicky because everybody has a little different approach to goals. I found, or there's a million different approaches. So are you writing that in your notebook while you're out, or do you wait till you get home and then you're writing it down and planning it out? It's it's all done the night before. That's that is definitely I've, I've done a lot of research in this, and that's it. The night before, plan your day for the next day. Plan it out. Like where, so you've got your goal and you've broken it down into smaller chunks. Um, where did you actually do that though? Like so, you're on your walk, you're on your long walk, thinking okay. about your three year goal, right? Okay. Are yeah. you, is it going in the notebook? No, no, it's, okay. it's going in a specific, it's going in, the notebook's just for small little yeah, ideas right. and notes, um, the, then you just you get, a, get a very large piece of paper and a, a big black marker yeah. and stick it up in your wall if you want, and breaking it down into your, again, starting with the, the three-year goal, writing down what it's going to be, where you want to be, what you want to be doing, how you want to be feeling, mm-hmm. and then... The break going down the one year goal and what you where you would need to be so that you'll be at the three year mark. Where would you need to be in one year, and what do you need to do? Then the six months. What yeah. what where do you need to be at six months, and what do you need to what mm-hmm. do you need to do to get there? And then you've got the three months, the one months, and then you, again the timeline can be your own, um, and the one week. So you've got and then once you break it down into that. So I've, you've got it broken down up into the right what you need to do this week. That's going to bring you closer, mm-hmm. 
and then you plan it out the night before. So you're talking about before you go to bed tonight, get yourself a little piece of paper. And go right. You've, once you've you know done the walk, find what's going to light you up, then come to that end, that end point in three years' time of where you'd like to be. And so what? Again, you've broken it down, and then so you've you've come back down to this week. And so what do you need to do tomorrow? Mm-hmm. It's going to get you there. And it, and it might just be one thing. This is, yeah. again, right. you, you don't want to set yourself up for failure right. and give yourself too much to do. Just Maybe it's just one little thing. It's going to bring you that step closer. Yeah. And so, yeah, make it 100% achievable or as close as possible. And the next day you wake up, you know, you go to bed that night knowing what you're going to do the next day. Yeah. And, again, it shouldn't, shouldn't feel like a chore it should be like, yeah. Because it's all coming from this thing down the road that lights you up, yes, right? Exactly. So, so just to recap, so make sure I understand it. So the walk, the long walk is kind of the soul searching. What is that goal, mm. that sort of long-term goal that's going to light me up? Yeah. Then you get home, you bust out the big whiteboard piece of paper, whatever you've got. You're breaking it down breaking into it down. smaller chunks right down to the week. And then tonight I'm writing down what's going to happen tomorrow to move me towards that one-week goal. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. There was a similar process that uh, was promoted at a real estate uh, company I worked at, which was Keller Williams, which is actually that book I mentioned earlier, The One Thing by Gary Keller. That's the guy who founded Keller Williams with his partner. Um, And they were big believers in that too, which is you've got your long-term goal and now you're breaking it down. They had some catchy little thing for it, but it ended up at weekly goals, which built your daily routines, which, yeah, cool. And identify. he's a big believer in what is the... The one thing I can focus on that will make everything else easier or unnecessary, right? Like that, like you said, you know, it's an attainable thing. The one thing that you're doing tomorrow, it might be a five-minute phone call. It might be something really not hard or long or, you know, arduous. It might just be like, oh, because I thought about it, it's clear to me that calling this person will move me forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Where you, instead of just getting caught up in all the people trying to take your time and like, hey, this email and, you know, I need to, I got a flat tire on my bike. Can you give me a ride down to the shop or, you know, yeah. Yeah. And you've you got to be open to flexibility too, of, of where, you know, may, you might be steered in a different direction and then you check in and go, well, how does that feel? Yeah. And, you know, maybe go with it, enjoy the journey. You know? <laughs> Something funny I'll admit to you. I'm, I like people have, I've gotten feedback that the more authentic I am on the show, the more people like it. Right. So it's like, just admit this stuff. Right. I forgot to put our meeting to do this podcast in my calendar. Right. And so I was sitting here and I was actually in the middle of a time block. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. This is good practice for me. I had my time block of that one thing, which for me right now is finishing the better me game, which today and for the next couple days, maybe hopefully just a couple more days means editing the cards, proofreading them, make sure I totally like them because I'm about to print a thousand copies of it, right? So I was editing cards and then I got your message. (laughs) Luckily I saw it and it said, I'm on my way. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, okay. So had to find a spot to stop and get the mic out and all that. Um, So (laughs) feeling slightly guilty. Yeah. Like, but I can, I can still finish my time block later. Nice. Um, But it did, it, it changed my day. You know, I had to kind of, Oh wait, but Hey, I, this was something I said I wanted to do. We already agreed on the time. Okay, yes, I'm doing it. You know, and it all fits. Like you were saying, this kind of stuff does light me up. Like I'm getting all excited right now just talking about this. Nice, yeah. um, and this fits together in my big picture with the Better Me game, which is a personal development friendship game, how to live better. Um, that's what this podcast is about too. So, you know, there's nice. no reason to get upset. At, oh, I have to do a podcast about how to help people live better. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, I can take a few minutes off of the, the card editing to do this. It's, I've tried to, I just feel like in the last year and a half, I've really been able to kind of integrate everything I'm working on is going in one direction. Um, I don't know if I told you, I sold the flea market back in Bellingham, Washington, which was usually a pretty fun business to own. I learned a lot about just crazy you know, like I told you, we did the old advertising stuff, and I had to learn all about everything from firearms to antique lighters to, you know, which magazines were really rare. You know, there's certain life magazines that people <laughs> actually buy and certain yes. ones they don't care about, you know, okay. stuff like that. This one I can get $3 for. This one I can't sell for a quarter. You know, anything with Kennedy's face on it will sell. Uh, you know, it, it was an interesting yeah. business, nice. but it was also, like, not not moving all in the same direction as my other goals. And it was taking most of my time. Uh, anyway, I, 
I sold that, came over here to Thailand, where now I can focus on all this stuff that's going in one direction. Nice. And it really lights me up. Mm. The flea market thing is fun. Yeah. If I if I had a magic way, like if somebody in Chiang Mai is listening and they have a flea market and I can come by once or twice a week for a few hours and help you out, that actually sounds fun to me. Mm. But running one and owning it and having it control most of my time doesn't sound fun to me. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? Giving up the things that you enjoy. Yeah. To do more of the things that you love, yeah. and that, and, and also you've got that story about the the woman that bakes the really good uh, cakes, and she's like, oh, and they're like, you should start a business, and then she does, and the the, yeah, the joy goes out, yeah. it, it turns into a business. Yeah, yeah. I've and heard about that with people that love scuba diving, so they become a commercial diver, and then yeah. all of a sudden they don't like it. Yeah, I did that. Did you? Yeah. Oh, you know, I mean, I wrote that down. What, yeah, you did scuba where? In uh, Koh Tao. And you were taking people out on dives? Is that what you were doing? I was just, I was. I finished training and uh, I, it just wasn't something that I really wanted to do. Yeah. Um, I thought it was. And uh, I was watching people that were doing it on a full-time basis and I thought, no, it's, yeah. it was more just a, an enjoyable thing. Um, but, you know, the journey itself is just a beautiful thing. Yeah. Do you know Johnny in town? He used to be a yes, dive master. Yeah, he was uh, just ahead of me in his training. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. He talks about that. Uh, he loves scuba diving and still does it, but he didn't really love being, I don't know, dive master, right? Yeah. Like taking people out. And he was the guy that had to like clean off all the equipment and put everything away and da, 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 do yeah. all that stuff that everybody else was yeah. like, cool, where's dinner? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. So now he's in a position where he goes scuba diving for fun and somebody else is cleaning and putting away all the stuff. And Yeah. That's the way, that's the way you want it. Um, but yeah, a fun experience to do. Like I definitely recommend it. Uh, yeah, do your training to be a dive master. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, beautiful uh, journey to go on. I'm just I'm and maybe it is your thing. That's a yeah. Thing. Oh, for yeah, some yeah, people, yeah, for yeah, sure, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'm just laughing about thinking about how sorry everybody feels for Johnny when he was grinding it out. You know, taking people on scuba dives every day down in Kotal. You know, it's <laughs> kind of it's all relative, I guess, right? It's it's fun. There's somebody in Minneapolis right now going, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I feel terrible for you, buddy. <laughs> and I'll give Johnny a plug too. Cause I've been on his show a couple times, and uh, and he's he's so cool. He was in the video promotion stuff that we did for Better Me, and uh, his girlfriend Larissa also is in the video and has done testimonials. He's helped me out a lot. They're both great people. Um, he has a podcast that's called Travel Like a Boss, and he focuses a lot on uh, the business side of becoming location independent and he also does talk about you know his trip to some cool island that he'd never been to he'll review things like co-working spaces in different cities nice, yeah. if you're if you're wanting to be a digital nomad or location independent uh, i really recommend that podcast it's called travel like a boss and i think his uh blog is just johnnyfd.com or something similar to that so anyway there's free plug for Johnny nice and before I ask you so we've been talking about what you do as, before I forget to ask you we've been talking about your coaching so if somebody's interested in getting involved do you have spots available right now how would they get in touch with you um, we, my website connordoran.com c-o-n-o-r-d-o-r-a-n okay and uh, you can check out my YouTube channel um, I think type in at this point type in, in Connor Doran or The Conscious Change you can also check out my Facebook page, The Conscious Change. And uh, I've also got a group page that I um, have backed off a little on at the moment. But uh, the, the Little Conscious Change, which is talking about that whole little process. Yeah, Yeah. so yeah, check out my website, cool. connordoran.com. Can you spell it one more time? C-O-N-O-R-D-O-R-A-N. Okay, and if you're listening to this, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, I'll for sure make sure it's up on the post at odionlife.com, which is where this podcast lives. Um, just in case you can't remember how to spell that, we'll link to you. Um, anything else you want to cover? You know, I told you, we're almost at an hour and 30 right yeah. now. It, it just goes like that. Indeed. Um, any any final thoughts or things you want to cover, though, before we come No, I, I think that's it. It's um, Just get, get uh, just do more of what you enjoy. That would be the one thing I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like your the way you word it. What lights you up? Exactly. I'll remember. That's one of my takeaways from this. Yeah, it's definitely it's got to excite you, and if it doesn't, then move on to something else. You'll, yeah. you'll, it might take a bit of time for you to find it because it just doesn't. It's funny that it just you, know, you think that you should know it, but yeah. we get so sidetracked and so confused with life and uh, the things that things that are thrown at us. Yeah. A long, a good long walk in nature with no technology. 
will really get you in tune with yeah. you know, what you want to do. And I, it might take I agree walks. totally with you, that. You might get it on the yeah. first walk. You, know, that's, you might have to do a few walks, but you'll eventually get it. And when you do, you'll be more right. all about, you all might more as well happier. Go for the walks, for the, the exercise and the peace anyway. And once in a while, you're going to have these ideas. Yeah. Uh, the last example of that for me, and I've had them happen on hikes and um, just – I used to walk around uh, along the railroad tracks by the beach because my dog liked hanging out at the beach. And I would walk actually on the track itself just because it was kind of fun. But also it would clear my mind because you have to focus. Probably like when you're making your candles maybe, I'm guessing. Um, Anything that requires your focus, for me anyway, it clears my mind of all the thoughts. Um, So I know for some people it's gardening. For me it's walking on a railroad track. That's one of them. And my dog's off doing his thing, so I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone. It's like my meditation. But the last one, it was a little different than that. I was riding on my motorbike over to visit my friend Brittick, who was in town. And so I was taking a day off. I thought I was, right? I'm, I'm going to have this unproductive but fun day. And my focus of that day was just having a good time with my friend who was in town. And on the way to go see him, when I really just kind of was zoning out, I started doing some uh, of my affirmations. And um, if, you, if you're familiar with affirmations, the one I was saying at the time was making millions, helping millions, making millions, helping millions. And you can go either way, helping millions, making millions, helping millions, making millions. And I just say that as kind of a mantra. For me, riding a motorcycle is a really good time to do these. Sometimes it's with music on, sometimes it's not. I was going, helping millions, making millions, helping millions, making millions. And it leads, then my brain started thinking, well, yeah, okay, how? You know, it just kind of that's, leads that's to, the thing, yeah, the question. Yeah. Because really, then the mind's got to come up with the answer right. once you give it the question. And then I thought of the most obvious thing that it's amazing to me. I haven't thought of it earlier, but for years I've had people that I know through my positive thinking page and positive atmosphere have told me, you should be a coach. You know, uh, why aren't you a coach? You have this big Facebook page, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that you can, uh, you know, advertise to and get on board and all that. And I knew they, in a way they were right, but something, it didn't settle right with me. It didn't light me up. And I wasn't quite sure why, but I knew there was just something in it that I, I didn't really feel, I, I didn't want to call myself a life coach just because of my own hangups with those two words, I guess. But on the way over to visit my friend, I went, wait a minute, mastermind groups. I've Every time I've been in one, I've made huge progress. I'm totally sold on the concept. Yes. They work. And I know a lot of people who they're sold on the idea and the concept as well because they've read a book that talked about it or whatever, um, but they don't really have a group of people that want to be in one with them. They don't know who to start one with. And even if they had a group, they don't really know how one is run. And I've been in enough that I know that part. And I have the big loudspeaker to the world to get other people involved, right? And it just hit me, like, on my day off, that's it. I can coach mastermind groups. I can facilitate mastermind groups. And it was on one of these, you know, days that seemed like I was setting it aside to be unproductive that I had the best idea I've had in a while. And I just went for it, and it's our, we had our first one yesterday. Nice one. Um, so, anyway, that's my long story to say that I totally agree with you. These walks, this time off, you know, can not only be enjoyable, but it can be hugely productive too once in a while definitely you yeah. can't really predict it like you said yeah yeah um last thing i'd like to do oh if you want to be in a mastermind group go to odionlife.com everything's there but can we pull a card from the game real quick we can indeed so we've played better me before and uh here's my shameless plug part of the episode right talked about the mastermind groups better me is a board game that is just about to go into production but right now it's uh free online you lovely can, game thank you and you can print the board, and the cards are all online, so you don't have to print off and cut out, cut out all the, the cards. Is that the best I can say about it? Lovely. It's lovely. lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the game a lot. It's, Good. I recommend people play can it. Can I ask you why? What did you like about it? Well, that's, it's the thing. It's that interaction. You know, it's, it brings you deeper. You really get to know people better. And uh, you just uh, hear, their, uh, where are we without our stories? That's how I met you, isn't it? Yeah. I just realized that. I think that was the first time I talked to you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think we might have seen each other in Facebook groups, but never met before that. Yeah. I th- well, I think it's, it was actually Better Me that uh, I, I seen a post of Better Me, and I thought, well, that's you know, that's just all about what I do. Yeah. And I thought well, that's really cool. I want to know more about that and more about the person who's creating it. Yeah. 
And I, I remember that was the first time I heard you mention your, your little, you know, little sugar, little this, little that. Nice. Yeah. 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 So yeah, great game. Cool. Great, yeah. Um, I'll let you pick the category. You're the guest. Um, mind, tangibles, body, heart, people. And I think I will go with, let me see. Let's go with people. People. <laughs> Look at that guy. Looks like Mario or something. Okay. This is uh, on the free cards, which are online at uh, bettermegame.com. So, many of us have been fortunate to have wonderful mentors. They may have been teachers, coaches, employers, family friends, etc. How could you give back? Is there someone you could help to guide? Helping mentor others can be one of the most rewarding experiences you'll ever have. Receive one point for drawing this card. Well, this is basically what I'm doing, isn't it? Uh, uh, helping people out on their journey. Uh, I've got a lot of experience, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm you know forever the student, forever the teacher. Yeah. And yeah, um, it's it's such a blessing to help people on their journey, to give them guidance, and to get them clearer into what they're doing. That's yeah. what I do. Yeah. And it feels good doing it. It also sounds like you've had some great mentors too. Yeah, um, <laughs> I have. I've, uh, you know, my mom, my dad uh, have been just. A blessing, just uh, um, absolutely amazing parents. My grandfather, uh, some guy that I can just wow, I just go, what, avid fly fisherman, president of the Anglers Association, singer in the local church choir, you know, gardener. You know, so you're uh, just all this fresh food and fresh fish oh, coming man. in on a daily basis. He was a builder, a carpenter, an electrician, a plumber. Wow, <laughs> um, this guy's a jack of all trades, yeah. just uh, such an amazing man. And uh, yeah, well, I talk about my mom and dad. I've got this story of uh, Christmas Day, and there I am, Christmas Day, and uh, I'm 13 years old. I don't believe in Santa, but uh, it's just, it's still a special day, yeah. and uh, I've got the big present from you know, for Christmas on Christmas Day. I don't know what it is. And I know that my mum's got me a little gift. She bought me a guitar, which I don't fucking want. I just don't <laughs> want it. I have no interest in it whatsoever. Absolutely none. I swear to God. I think I just had no. She's one buying tea, and she got me this really. Oh, you told her no, and she still bought it. Yeah, she still bought it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, there it was on Christmas Day, and it's it was this shitty little guitar with the, uh, you know, the action from the the strings to the bridge was about I think one centimeter. And um, but so there it was in the special gift for Christmas. My dad got me a Black and Decker workbench that wasn't even assembled, and, and I'm looking at it on Christmas Day, going, you know, what am I gonna? I, it's I just no. What, why would life do this to me and give me a workbench? Like what am I gonna fucking do with a workbench on Christmas Day? And it wasn't even assembled. Again. I'm 13 and I'm fucking miserable. Do I need a workbench to assemble the workbench? Or? Fuck. Yeah. So I picked up the guitar that I didn't want. Uh, and I haven't put it down since. And it went from the guitar to the mandolin really? to the piano, to the harmonica, to the drums, to just learning instruments and loving music. And I wouldn't be the person I am today, obviously, without music. And so I really thank my mom for that. And I also thank my dad. You know, it's like, <laughs> had he not got me this really shitty workbench, I wouldn't have picked up the guitar. Oh, really? Possibly. Wow, funny. Yeah. I still have the workbench, by the way. Interesting. Cool. <laughs> have you used it at all? Yeah, I use it all the time. Yeah. Well, that's it. Like, I ended up, I could go into stories where, you know, I was the handyman at a, at a uh, monastery down in Copenhagen, a place called Wat Ko Tam. Um, I did that for a I while. that island. Yeah. Um, so I've done, you know, I spent a lot of time in the building sites building joinery putting on roofs wow. steel fixing so that's what my father did my grandfather so there was a delay you did use the workbench but uh, yeah but not at 13 I didn't want right. it on Christmas day I didn't want it then come on I, said, yeah. well, I used it I think when I was older how, how long do you think it took <laughs> you to actually use it um, I think it was about I don't think I think it was about six months oh okay not yeah, too it bad. wasn't about you but it was just wow I was using it to hold a piece of wood to chisel something. Yeah. But yeah, it's not something I wanted to do. It wasn't lighting me up for some reason on yeah. Christmas Day. And that's what the guitar did, yeah. That's it, really it, that's it a cool story. Up. Yeah. It was fun. Um, you're reminding me of 
things that my dad did for me, which were kind of like workbench related stuff. He would let me use his tools, I think, more than some dads might, uh, even though sometimes I would forget them in the woods or whatever. Yes. But I think he saw the <laughs> end, you know, benefit to it. Uh, I was learning valuable things. And I remember he, we had a wood burning fireplace and he got me one log, stump, whatever you want to call it, a block of wood. And he gave me a coffee can full of the shortest nails that you can get, you know, like a roofing nail, like the really, they're almost tacks with a very flat head. Like you can't really bend it, right? It's almost impossible to not drive this nail in the right way. So he gave me a coffee can full of those nails. And I think he gave me a hammer or let me use his and he gave me this log and he showed me how to drive nails into it. And I mean, you know, half the time I'm hitting my thumb and stuff, but I learned and I'm, I don't know, I must've put a thousand nails in that one piece of wood, but, uh, you know, it was cool. And I learned and, and I still, when I hammer a nail, I remember that cause I can hammer a long nail straight now. Nice. And I, it makes me think of my dad and especially you know, not to be judgmental, but when I see somebody that can't and the, the nail gets all crooked and they try to straighten it out and everything, it reminds me of my dad. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's cool things, yeah. It's, we mightn't, you know, appreciate them at the time, but yeah. you know, it's like they, they, this, again, this is this, uh, you know, accountability and mentorship that's going on and, you know, a direction, giving you direction. You're like, I don't want to do that. And my, my dad threw me on the building sites when I was 13. Oh, yeah. You know, this was the, you know, the, the Black & Decker workbench was a sign of what of things to come. Your dad yeah. was also a carpenter or yeah, yeah, builder? Yeah. Okay. And so it was like summer, summer holidays and boom, let's go. Oh, cool. uh, let's get you in here and let's get you uh, <laughs> working on the site. Yeah. And again, all my, you know, my friends were all off having fun and yeah. I had to work. Right. And I didn't like it at the time. <laughs> But I absolutely love him for it now. And then you end up on a tropical island doing, you know, yeah. the same thing, I guess. Yeah. And so that's at least three generations, your grandfather, your father, and you. Yeah. Or is it even more? How many? I mean, a lot of... Was that, it, that's it, yeah. Yeah, cool. And I, I'm not sure what my... Well, my, my great... My, I'm not sure what my grandfather's father did. That was back when probably everybody did some of that, right? I mean, pretty yeah. much. Oh, I know what my... Uh, yeah, my, my, grand, my grandmother's father was a, was a farmer. Yeah. yeah, so I'm not really, but yeah, um, it's definitely in the family. The were, were they in Donegal? Yes. Who? who sorry, your grandmother's <laughs> my, family. My father. grandmother's father were outside Donegal in Northern Ireland. Okay, a place called Tamnir. I just wonder when you said my grandmother's parents, it made me think my grandmother's parents came over from Ireland. The O'Donnells were up in Donegal. Her family was somewhere else. Anyway, I just they might have crossed paths. Yeah, maybe they hung out. Yeah, yeah they might have built a house together. There or you go. Yeah, <laughs> nice, cool, um, good. So there you go. Better me. We got off on things I never would have learned about you. Um, so guys, thank you for listening again, Connor. Thank you very much yeah. for coming on. Thank you, Dan. Um, go check out Connor's website. You know, get involved with his coaching if you're looking for somebody to keep you moving in the right direction. Um, I really believe in that mentorship, and uh, Connor can do wonders for you. So thanks, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Dan. I really yeah. appreciate it. So Connor Doran, C-O-N-O-R-D-O-R-A-N.com. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Remember, uh, comment on YouTube. Give us a five-star review on iTunes and all of that. We really appreciate it, and we will see you next time.